And today I'm joined by Fraser and Toby. Um, so Fraser is co-founder and CEO of Checked, as I'm sure many of you already know. And Tobias or to Toby is our head of partnerships. Um, and we're going to be talking about a few things today. We'll run through um, a kind of a product update, some, bait, some key things around what we've been doing on the network side in terms of um, some proposals. Talk through our new partnership that's been announced this month with uh, the Walt ID team and what that means for us and our partners and prospective customers. Um, give a quick update on AFJ, Aries Framework JavaScript integration, so a few kind of technical product things. Um, then we're going to talk through the launch of our new website, kind of the first phase of our new website and the kind of the narrative that you'll see on there. And um, that will lead us into a deeper discussion, which will take on the bulk of the conversation around trusted data markets um, and the new piece of content that Toby's brilliantly written, which is a really effective, um, effective communication of kind of our long term vision at Checked. Cool. So without further ado, um, Fraser, maybe um, I can kind of begin posing a question to you and we can both sort of like give a bit of information on this. Um, so the first thing was around community pool tax. And we've recently submitted a proposal which has um, gone through a bumping community pool tax from 2% to 5%. Um, so maybe Fraser, one for you, like how does this actually benefit um, the community and kind of checked um, network overall in your in your view? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think it's just really easily put by what we saw with Animo. So for those who aren't aware or maybe have joined more recently, um, Animo are one of our partners. Um, and got back in summer, they basically went out of their way to demonstrate Anon creds on, um, on Checked. And Anon creds are... Um, a specific type of credential format that use ZKPs. Um, so we're actually toying internally with like renaming them ZK creds just because of the ZK hype in like the crypto markets. Um, but basically what they allow you to do is if you have a, a credential or more credentials, you can then use um, and they're anon creds. You can then effectively use a thing called selective disclosure, which means that if you have say, 15 attributes on a credential, you can share three of them to someone else, um, or you can share five of them. But the key thing is like the person who receives them only sees those, those attributes. They don't see the whole thing. Um, and what's really cool is like, you can do that for multiple credentials. So you could say, take your driving license and your, I don't know, driving license and I don't know your credit score or something, whatever reason, and share them to someone else and then redact different parts. And the reason this was so cool, and there's like a direct relation to someone to like a, a, a potential client that we're speaking to today. Um, they basically just did it. Like they just did it to demonstrate it and just show off. And then ever since then, they've been doing a project called uh, basically ledger independent and on creds. And so, um, basically they, they pulled from they they put a request into the community pool to pull down from it and it was basically i think it was a mix of like um a bit of a reward for the work that they'd already done but it was also to fund some work going forwards which was around um which was around like building out full and on cred support um on checked um using like every stream with javascript which we'll touch on later and Aerie, I think Aerie's cloud agent Python, so Akapi. And then I think there's a third one um, that they've also like, taken a look at as well. And I think like one of the big reasons for, for increasing the volumes going into the community pool is like the business value they've generated off that is massive. And especially as like the value of that, that amount of that, um, that pool goes up, we're expecting like even bigger things from it. And to to put it into like relief, this is like really, really good timing because we were on a call early with Animo and a potential client who I'll leave unnamed and even the type unnamed because it's big. Um, but basically like the work that they've been doing ties this all together at the perfect time when a client is looking to move off a ledger that they use Anon creds on, so Indie, Sovereign, and they're looking to migrate off. And basically, between ourselves and Animo, 
we're sat here to be like pretty much the perfect solution for them. Like Animo, not only not only have they built all this tooling out, but they've also like created migration scripts for like if you wanted to move from Sovereign to to Checked. So they're just the perfect partner to have. And so really all of that was funded or partially funded out of the community pool. And I think the big thing for increasing the, the, the percentage going into that is we really want more stuff to be to come out of that. Like we want the people on this call to be proposing stuff, whether that is like events or sponsoring stuff. Like it's, I mean, this is exactly how uh, secret has the secret agents. So it's, it's all about like empowering that kind of like community governance, but also the just creating stuff. So, um, I mean, personally I'm in favor. Um, it's just, it, it creates a load of value and sometimes you, won't necessarily see it so i know that like the anon creds thing is kind of disappeared off in the background like but it really has a big difference when we're going and speaking to clients and all of that was because they pulled down from the community pool so yeah i i realized i've rambled on a lot there ross but it's it's been a really awesome day from that perspective where like something that the community funded like last summer has come around and just gener- generated this like colossal amount of value in a client conversation today no, it wasn't rambling. I think it was very, very effective. And I think that's, um, yeah, like, as, as I heard earlier, kind of the conversations are really kind of moving forward because of this. So, um, so yeah, if there's any questions around the community pool, like, do let us know. I think um, I think it's kind of like a really effective way for you to get involved as a community. There's obviously like various different things that you can do. But I think seeing that the way that community pool is used will be, you know, additional votes that sometime get put in place. So, you know, at, at some point, um, someone might come forward suggest another project is funded similar to this one and that can really sort of move things forward so um, keep an eye out for any um, community pool sort of governance votes that come through cool um, the next topic that we were going to c- cover and we've talked about this a bit over the past month and we've had a blog that went out um, about two weeks around this was around our partnership with Walt um, Walt ID so Perhaps, Toby, if I could just go to you first, just to kind of share a little bit about the partnership side of Walt, and then I can share a little bit around um, the technical side of things. So, yeah, sure. maybe. Yeah. Sure, sounds good. So, um, so Walt ID are a probably, probably the fastest growing um, self sovereign identity vendor currently in Europe. They've got a, a FCE compliance wallet, which is well rated, which is important in terms of scalability when all those regulations uh, are enacted um, in the forthcoming, well, this year and next year, essentially. Um, but more importantly than that, they're, they're a good partner to work with, mainly because as an infrastructure provider, which is similar to us on the application layer, they also work with a lot of other SSI vendors, people who we either already partner with or would wish to partner with in the future. And um, the team themselves are um, a good blend, I'd say, of technologists um, and also people who, who, who are sound strategically and have a good um, understanding of business development um, and are commercially astute, therefore. So as they grow, um, which they are growing uh, well, and they've also got a good VC behind them called Speed Invest, who, who are a significant, significant player in the wider VC ecosystem in Europe, we can also grow with them. And that's why as a partner, you, you, you really want to find partners who are like that because partnerships are, are great because you obviously want to build technically together, build interesting products, uh, but also as well, you want to be able to strategically grow with a partner as well and have mutually beneficial alignments realistically. And and we definitely have that with Walt. Like Walt is um, very good actually for that, for opening doors for us in Europe, for um, being able to yeah, grow with us is the best way to put it. And um, and I know Fraser speaks a lot with Dom, who's the CEO there. I've, I've spoken a lot with Dom myself. He's really, truly, truly brilliant. He's been obviously on quite a few of these spaces with us. Uh, so our community probably have met him and have heard of him. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's, one of, uh, it's one of many partnerships we've done in the SSI vendor community, but it's definitely been one of the most uh, fruitful. Brilliant. Thanks, Toby. Um, yeah, and I think, you know, as Toby said there, Dom's, Kind of experience and just his um, knowledge based on a long history similar to kind of Fraser and Anchor having spent um, quite a long time deep into SSI means that he's got great connections into um, as Toby mentioned like EBC and EIDAS and various different kind of European bodies that are helping push forward um, SSI with regulation 
Um, and I guess going into the product side of this as well. So as Toby kind of said, they've got their um, FC compliant wallets. And one of the key things that's been, been really effective for us and what we've been uh, working on is uh, integrating the SSI kit into our wallet. So SSI kit is basically a completely standards compliant open source tool, similar to what we have um, with the Aries framework JavaScript SDK that we're work working on for ledger agnostic anoncreds. And then it also sits alongside Veramo and that suite of kind of tools. So right in the middle of the stack between applications and between checked as a ledger. So it acts as kind of like that bridge enabling developers to go off and actually start building the applications using um, like quite solid foundations and making it much easier um, to do so. And so with the tool, um, developers can basically now just um, quite easily set up the SSI kit um, and with this create DIDs um, and also issue and verify verifiable credentials as well. So it enables just kind of more opportunities, more ways of actually engaging with um, the check network and starting to be able to create kind of identity applications. And the particularly good thing about the SSI kit as well is that it's using um, OpenID for verifiable credentials for their stack. And OpenID is sort of um, one of the most important things in terms of upcoming regulations within the EU as well. And it aligns very much with the European digital identity architecture and reference framework, which is um, ultimately what's going to be kind of driving the the movement and the push towards actually regulating and um, making credentials, verifiable credentials, kind of like the standard for, for Europe. And um, one good kind of example of this is this same body that's doing this is pushing through verifiable credentials is the same one that actually um, put through the kind of the, the standards in place for things like DocuSign to exist. And so if you think of the size and the scale of something like DocuSign now used so broadly or other signing kind of like um, tools online, this is similar to that. This is a kind of a way of actually making verifiable credentials as um, as standardized as that. So really important for kind of future proofing our stack, making us kind of really um, aligned to where things are going with regulation and um, also just a really easy to use SSI kit. Cool. Um, Fraser, anything you'd like to kind of comment or add? I know you've got a um, great relationship with Dom as well, uh, the CEO of uh, Walt ID. Um, I think it's, I think kind of it's really related to like what Toby was saying. So they're, Walt ID are really unusual versus most SSI vendors in that they are doing work with like the EU and historically EBSI, like all that kind of crowd. And then at the complete opposite end of it have built out like generic or generalized NFT issuance, verification, gating, tooling. So they're just really, really unusual in the breadth that they have. And it shows through in what they develop and how like it's it's really broad um it can be used for all sorts it's cross-chain like multi-chain um and just a lot more like flexible um and as a result it means that like a lot of people pick them up because of that flexibility they get used by like they do really really well across crypto because the sdks and stuff that they're building out typically like you can just use and you can reasonably like extend it pretty well and it also includes the, the thing that we found that was really surprising where uh, they showed us like verification profiles and we hadn't seen that anywhere else but they made it in a way that was like super configurable very very easy to use and it's just not stuff that you see necessarily that many other places so the only thing I'd like to call out is just that they've got a slightly unusual focus. Is that they're like, yes, they would call themselves maybe an SSI vendor, but they do a load of other stuff. And it means that they've been a really, really good partner for exactly that reason, because they have that slightly different view of the market um, and have a slightly different technology to other people in there. It's a, Strangely, they somehow serve like massive governments and then also degenerate crypto people at the same time um which is really impressive i've actually got a follow-on uh question from that if if that's okay um is that okay of course yeah 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 so when you mentioned about how adobe came um adobe oh, signed lost ross yeah he's still there 
I'm here. Ross? Everyone. Yeah, yeah, he's still I'm there. Oh, I, either I lost your audio or you weren't speaking, one of the two. Yeah, it's been bugging out. I think Toby, Toby's been having the same issue. I know I have. Um, sorry, what I was going to say was, when you were mentioning about how Adobe was born from version one of the EI DAS Toby, regulations... Uh, no, I'm not talking matters. Can you not hear me, Fraser? I think you may have to rejoin Fraser because Matt, Matt was talking before. Oh, space is killing me. Okay, yes. I'll be back in two seconds. No worries. Um, so anyway, I'll, I'll ask yourself anyway, Ross, I don't know if you've heard about the Content Authenticity Initiative, which is what Adobe's basically um, started embarking on, which is a way by uh, building a community of tech companies and NGOs, academics to assign um, proof to content for things like images, pictures, uh, written content in the form of using verifiable credentials. So it's, it is interesting watching Adobe move forward on that. And I'm curious to know, if, do you know anything about that? Because the reason I'm asking is as well as a community member actually pitched the question in main channel um, a couple of days back during the week, I think it was Wednesday. And um, they asked the question, how could Checked get involved in doing something similar with that? Yes, it's not something that we've been discussing, like specifically to that. But I know, like, as more and more, um, more and more things have been coming up since the AI hype, you know, really launched the last couple of months, more and more people have been saying, like, how do we actually go about proving when something has been AI generated versus human generated and all these things. So um, there's definitely kind of a space for verifiable credentials in those kind of areas. So, yeah, Matt, I think raise that in um, one of our Slack channels and we should definitely start that conversation because it sounds very uh, appropriate for, for a couple of things that we're working on. So, yeah, it's good to hear, but no, not something that we've kind of had any research into, definitely for not from my side. Um, cool. OK, let's um, let's continue. So I think that kind of like wraps up the key things around the product side. We also were going to mention a little bit around the um, AFJ integration as well. Um, but I think to, um, Fraser did cover that off quite nicely with the conversation around kind of Animo and the work they've been doing. So, um, but just for anyone that is interested, Aries Framework JavaScript, one of our main SDKs, um, we are kind of in the um, latter stages um, of doing some testing, working through the kind of like final pieces of that. Um, so won't give any kind of specific estimates of dates, but we're going to be um, yeah looking forward to kind of sharing some updates on that with our partners very soon. So moving on to the next key topic. So this week we launched our new website. If you haven't seen it, just go to checked.io and you'll see kind of a new, uh, new, new website there. And it's been sort of it's taking some time to, to work through kind of what the narrative we want to have on it, how we want to kind of position ourselves. Um, but the real um, exciting thing is that it's up. It's going to be this initial page is up right now. But over the next um, month, couple of months, we'll be adding more pages, you know, going deeper into our solution, what our ecosystem is, and then also adding a developer page specifically for um, all the people that want to start building with Check. So these are all kind of in the pipeline, but we just wanted to get something initial up to, to get things moving. And that kind of like is the key thing that I wanted to talk through with Toby and Fraser. And it bridges very nicely into the conversation that we're going to have around the Trusted Data Markets blog. Um, so maybe Fraser, Toby, I know you've been leading a lot on the kind of the narrative alongside Eduardo around the website. So maybe you could start by sharing to us, like, how did we sort of land on pushing for this to be like the infrastructure for trusted data as the kind of the key point? Um, I'll give a bit of a bit of a critique of i think where the messaging on ssi has gone wrong um a bit but it, i think all, honestly all credit for the term goes to goes to toby um so if you if you look at most of the talk about self-sovereign id or decentralized id or managed id web 5 it's very much like geared towards like the consumer and the individual it's like reclaim your data you can own your data like it's all about that control and, and returning it which is all good stuff, but it's not geared towards companies. And the reality is like, um, as individuals, we could either like lobby against companies or put things through regulation by government, but that stuff takes a lot of time. And the reality is companies are motivated by profit and money, typically. It's unusual if they aren't. They yeah, do exist, but like a bit more unusual. Um, and so, all of the marketing and all of the historic like push and the narrative 
has been very, very to like pushed towards the individual. Um, and I think it's credit to Toby that he, he spotted like the narrative shift that was needed to to put it much more towards companies um, because that's realistically who has all the data, needs to issue the data and needs convincing to do so. So having um, having a load of language, which is all about like the individual and control and ownership doesn't work that well when you go and speak to a company. But if you start talking about markets and money and th- that kind of thing, suddenly there is prick up. So um, yeah, I think that's that's just a bit of a prelude of like, where I th- where I think it's gone wrong historically, and I'll hand over to Toby from like where he managed to magic up the phrase because um, I definitely can't take credit for it. I, I honestly am a, a, almost a little bit embarrassed um, because a um, I don't think it. I'm not even sure if it was me that magicked up the phrase. I think I basically I was. Um, I was researching something um, for something completely different. It was called the Salesforce App Exchange. And it's basically because I wanted to work with Fraser uh, to design a self-serving partnership ecosystem for Checked, which is still still obviously planned and et cetera. And, and I think at the time I was like, uh, we were speaking to a lot of enterprise customers, as Fraser mentioned, and I, was, and, and I just thought, oh, you know, Salesforce do this in a really interesting way, actually. Um, and really what they're exchanging is, is of, of value to their infrastructure, but also it has a catch-all term where the value is, is almost um, spread, let's say, between the application providers, the customers that use Salesforce as an infrastructure, and the apps, hence, hence the value exchange. And I was like, oh, wouldn't it be cool to be cool to call, like, you know, wouldn't be a good term for, for check because we're an infrastructure like a trusted data exchange. And then for some reason, it kind of morphed a little bit more into markets. Um, mainly because I think that's really what stuck most with the customer. And I think that that is a good thing about working in Checked, actually. Um, and I've been in you know, lot, quite a lot of startups now. And the ones which, which have got this right have typically done well and, you know, been acquired or gone to late funding rounds, got lots of customers, blah, blah, blah. blah. But basically what you need to do is, realistically, is it is very necessary to listen to what works with the customer. Uh, that goes for product, that goes for business development, that really goes for anything in any company. And that's what stuck with customers. It's easy to understand, it's data that I can trust, and there's a market dynamic where that trusted data uh, can form um, and be transacted upon. And I think it's just easier, like Fraser mentioned, to explain it in that respect, because if you're going from a, um, let's say, if you're communicating from a principle, which is, um, look, we found we've got some great technology, or we've solved a great engineer, you know, very difficult engineering problem. Uh, and then you're trying to position whatever that solution is within a market. Typically, that just doesn't work uh, because it could it could well be the case that you've solved an engineering problem that no one cared about, no one wants to pay any money for. And and SSI more than any other real technology, if you think about it, has to shift an entire paradigm which is out there already, which is you know in some respects identity, which I use as a broad term. Um, to encapsulate a lot of different forms of data realistically, but essentially it is shifting a, a, a well-established um, paradigm. So, you know, having no real commercial sort of language to associate that, to bring that towards a customer, who is a real critical part of forming that par- the new paradigm, uh, just it just seems like, a, you know, like Fraser mentioned, it's basically a non-starter. And and I think what we were learning quite quickly, me and Fraser, when we were talking to these customers is like, you learn, you do learn quickly in these conversations. If you have a lot of them, what works, what doesn't work, you iterate, you get better. And basically trusted data just stuck. Um, it's probably not the most amazingly you know, specific term. Maybe there's an argument that authentic data is actually a better term for, for what SSI does because trust is something which is notoriously difficult to define, to be frank. But you know, at the end of the day, like, no one's going to cry over spilt milk if we bring massive use cases to the market. So, so I hope that's yeah, the And I, I think um, one of the coolest things that's happened over this week is we've had a few conversations where, um, without us prompting them, that's the language that they've used. And I think it's been a, it's been proved to us that we, we've kind of landed on a good term or a good, like, category name for this in that, like, 
people in certainly business people seem to intuitively understand what's going on with it so rather than just having to explain anything they just get it um and we've not had to explain things like ssi credentials like any of this kind of stuff we're just like trusted data markets this is what happens and i yep get it okay like how do we how what use case are we going to do and then they start talking about okay well we've got loads of data and we could issue all of it um what's the highest friction for the user like what would make the biggest difference for them and what therefore what is the highest value and it just suddenly get i don't know if you noticed this toby it just gets through that like next level of conversation from something that's like trying to explain someone ssi to actually let's go and solve a problem together and yeah, that's been totally really agree. refreshing yeah totally agree and and those are such uh, important conversations for for us to have as as a company but also you know within ssi itself is it's very very important that you know we we stick to obviously all the great work of our predecessors and, and the terms and the definitions and they're they're amazing but it's also being able to have our own voice and report back of like well this is what's working really well actually with with customers large customers um and the reasons why we think that's working and and i and i think that's a cool perspective we can bring to the wider ssi market actually like we just did a great joint presentation actually with animo solutions who are an ssi vendor um and it was it was really awesome to see their style as well of, of presenting what they offer to the market learning a bit of them and and dare i say they've learned a bit off us as well and and that's really how i think you know the market itself is just inevitably going to evolve and grow is is we can all share learnings where we things we got wrong and things we got right and things that are sticking and things that aren't sticking and and this just happened to be a term that stuck brilliant and i think um yeah i think that kind of like takes us really nicely on to maybe digging a bit deeper into this this concept of trust and i know toby i'm not going to ask you to regurgitate your in your entire blog because it's obviously incredibly um in depth and um well researched but there's a few things that i guess i wanted to kind of like pull on um because i found the way that kind of you approach this and defined it is actually really um really quite interesting um and so maybe we could just begin by like kind of the one of the first parts of your blog which talks around um the role of trust within markets and kind of how traditionally trust has played a role within markets and the transition to how trust might be changed or how it might be developed or evolved because of a different way of um, trust being kind of managed and nurtured. So the kind of the first question is around, yeah, just like what role does trust play in a market? Well, I think, I think the best one to do is just to be concise is we, if we should just focus on like an economic, uh, sorry, an economist perspectives and, and how they think of trust within markets. Um, because, realistically that's the kind of markets that the check is going to be spinning up that they, they are going to have a transactional nature towards them um so we're not we're not really talking about like the kind of trust which which we've evolved from which was you know maybe where where markets originated from which is just the utility of cooperation and you know and the reputations which are derived from that cooperation in older markets etc but essentially that's to do with rules um and the rules which are formed to establish trust. Uh, and what I find really interesting about like doing a little bit of research about this, and I feel conscious about talking about this, because A, Ross has written a dissertation on this, which was amazing, which he didn't even tell me about before I read the blog, which would have been really useful, Ross, by the way. <laughs> um, but also Nikki is obviously someone who I've quoted in the, in the blog, who's an expert, and Fraser as well is, is, a, is, is an expert in the field. So I, you know, I'm going to tread carefully here. Um, but what I personally found interesting around this was is essentially the evolution from markets really were the establishment of rules and how those rules can conduct or assume compliant behavior, uh, supposedly tran uh, transparent behavior. But essentially, there is always a time to what we've coined as time to reliance, right, which is a critical component of how why one should trust anyone uh, not to be a fraudulent actor, for example, and time to reliance is modeled out by economists in something called the trust game. Um, but essentially its role, uh, let's say trust role, um, is how do you use time to reliance within these rule-based market dynamics uh, to establish trust in a market form? And then there's many other sort of mechanisms that you know are imposed on markets to try to shorten time to reliance. Like, you know, you've got to comply with regulations, uh, you've got to do X, you've got to do Y, which we deter which I've defined as the extra factor 
So that's actually more of an interpersonal definition of trust, which I basically lifted from Stanford's philosophical encyclopedia. But it's actually quite a good one. Um, and that extra factor is basically determined by lots of different mechanisms. But, but realistically, it's all about reducing time to reliance. So the role of trust in those kind of markets is in that respect. It's like, I need to be able to trust that other counterparties within the market structure um, are going to be willing to play by the rules, have a good motive, therefore, uh, because they do play by the rules. And the time, the more times that they do this, over time, the more I can establish trust between all parties. Yeah, I think I think that's like one of the things that I always found like quite interesting when I started researching that blockchain as this this tool for, for building trust because people obviously describe it as a as trustless um, in a way because you no longer have to necessarily have the, the kind of the, the human form of trust whereby you're trusting someone based on virtue or um, kindness of good gestures, but you're actually kind of removing the, the need for trust in a way because your trust becomes encoded. Um, and that kind of that way you're describing it, that like that time to reliance is a really interesting way of, um, of kind of picking it apart. Um, maybe you could talk a little bit more around like the trust, the trust game, because I think that was a really interesting piece of your um, piece of your blog as well, like kind of how how trust games actually evolve and play out. Yeah, for certain. So, I mean, it's a, li it's a little bit difficult to describe the trust game, to be frank, just on a Twitter space. So I'd recommend, if, you, if you're interested in reading the blog, I'd, I'd give it a read, um, because it's a bit better when it's illustrated out. Um, but essentially, like, in most variants, let's say, of the trust game, uh, basically subjects or participants within it themselves are anonymously paired in roles like sender and receiver. Um, and for example, the sender, the truster um, can either pass nothing, which is typically a, a, any kind of it, a, a nondescript monetary amount or any portion of that monetary amount to um, another receiver, which is the trustee. Um, and if the sender, the truster, keeps X, um, the experiments uh, conditions triple the amount. Um, and, and then essentially the receiver may either um, pass nothing on or pass any portion of that money back to the sender so the whole the whole point of the experiment or the model itself the trust game model is is meant to try to understand how trust is captured or inferred so that the other party within it will reciprocate a risky move typically at a cost to themselves um, in different conditions and it's basically a game which is run uh or as well kind of like, let's say, illustrated by a guy called Berg um, or Berg et al. So Berg and his other researchers, which is called a game tree. But essentially it's within cooperative re relationships and how this trust is established with repeated interactions over time, right? Um, so what's interesting from Czech's perspective in terms of trusted data markets, right? Um, and how that works, which may not necessarily rely on things like smart contracts which or trustless devices, um, because we're talking really about, you know, creating transactional value flows uh, within data itself and the value of verifiable data specifically, is what we're trying to understand is if, um, let's say if we insert a form of verifiability at a, at a stage in the trust game or a stage within a trusted market dynamic process, which is near a genesis, um, i.e. therefore uh, the time to reliance is shortened, what impact and modeling is can that have on a market dynamic itself, right? So let's say if it is established from inception, right? So at least I can trust that the trust, uh, so, sorry, that the issuer of this trust that is verifiably issued by them, that doesn't necessarily mean the data is trustworthy. Um, but basically it just means that uh, I can trust that it has been issued at least. It's interesting to model out what impact impact that actually has on the rest of the dynamic of the trust game and then basically like what that can mean for markets in general is that there's an extra element and, and that particular extra element is typically defined by things like discovering the motive of an actor within you know to use an SSI term let's say use trust triangle if I can establish the motive quicker of all actors within the trust game then I can actually lend more money out, send more money out, and I can prosper more than I would without that initial verifiability. 
Um, so the trust, basically, long story short, it's a little bit complex. As I said, it's a bit complex to explain just just on a Twitter space, to be honest, because it's, it's better done with a diagram uh, to illustrate the point. But basically, what it means is, is if you insert that verifiability, which you can obviously do with checked and SSI, the time to reliance reduces, which means that the participants in the trust game themselves can be better, uh, can take more risk and therefore achieve better rewards. Toby, I think Does that you, make um, sense? Probably, probably yeah, I think... everyone there. <laughs> no, you, I think you do yourself a disservice by saying it's better in a blog because the blog is brilliant. But I think you you explain that very eloquently. So um, yeah, no need to put yourself down for that. It's it's in, it's a complex, and I'm actually incredibly impressed by how you managed to communicate that. And what I what I love it. I mean, there's a few things within your blog that I kind of the way you've written it is um you know I can see people really wanting to to quote this and pull things out of it. Um, and the way you've kind of used this this verifiable trust as a kind of a, a corner piece of the blog itself. And one of the things that I started thinking about just then, and maybe Fraser, you might have some some thoughts on this, particularly with um, one thing that happened this week, which we noticed on LinkedIn, but is around this kind of like, you've got this sort of this history, this trustworthiness history that can kind of develop and evolve with an individual. And that kind of does also remind me of, you know, this, this idea of like a trusted reputation and how you can actually develop a reputation which people can trust. And I think lots of us, everyone's building their reputations, whether it's on Twitter or LinkedIn. And um, often we feel that reputation is by default trustworthy because someone has claimed it when actually um, the events of this week, which maybe Fraser you can speak to, just kind of demonstrate that your reputation is somewhat um, not trustworthy in its current form. Yeah, happy to. I, I don't know if anyone's aware of this, but there's there's some statistic out there that says... I think it was based in the US. It's something like 50% of people lie on their resume or their CV, as it's known properly. Um, but it's just a huge amount, like a huge proportion of people that are just lying on this stuff. And I don't think we've really been hit by it before. Um, we've we've had a few people that we've looked at hiring and then on interview, they're not as good as they say they are on paper. Um, but we've never been like, we've never had an issue where someone's just like outright lying about stuff. Um, and so th those of you who've like followed my Twitter account or Javed or Anchor's Twitter account over this week will have seen that we basically had a guy pretending like he was working for us. Um, and I think what was most, there, there was so many things that, that were incredible about this, but um, he'd, he'd said that he'd worked for us. He'd said that he'd done for like, I think nine to 13 months or something. Um, Everything that was on his LinkedIn was stuff that like we have done, but he deployed like he basically claimed that he built it before we even launched mainnet. So just like all of that was way off. Um, and we just we'd never heard of him. And then he I the reason we found out was a recruiter got in touch to basically check a reference for him. So he was basically in the final stages of an interview for someone. And like they just got in touch with like we've never heard of this guy. We don't know who he is. We have never interacted with him. It's not even like we interviewed him once and let him go, or we worked for them for a brief time. It's like we literally had no idea who this guy was. And so we just I at that I, I think if he'd if he'd not been so blatant and if he'd not picked a project like ours out, we probably would have maybe let him get away with it. But the fact was, it was like you picked a project where their whole focus is on verifiability, trust, and authenticity. So as a result, like we basically had to make a bit of an example. Um, <clears throat> so we tweeted across like Twitter and Telegram, obviously let the, the recruiters know. Um, and what was incredible was he tried to double down. Like he tried to be like, yeah, I know Ross, like definitely know Ross. Like I've worked with Ross and Ross was like, I have no idea who this guy is. Um, but it just shows like how unreliable like that data kind of is. And the famous one for this in the UK is Companies House. Like Companies House is so bad. Like it's just absolutely atrocious and just it, it's a known thing. And I have a hunch LinkedIn is probably going to go the same way in that like you just can't trust anything that's on there like the number of the number of times that we get approached by like exchange represent representatives on linkedin who are obviously fake is unbelievable we probably get about two or three a week at least and that's just me um 
but even worse were stories that I uh, was just having a brief like chat with um, with the recruiter, and he was like, "This isn't even the worst one. The worst one was when um, they heard of a, a company, and I don't think they recruited this guy via them, but they'd hired this guy as a solidity developer. Um, the guy interviewed perfectly fine, but it turned out he knew nothing." And what was actually happening was he was vaguely technically literate and he was fronting a like three to four person dev shop running out of China. And he was basically just taking requests, copying and pasting it to a load of developers who were then trying to like come up with stuff in the background. And anyway, this company realized what was going on because he couldn't deliver, couldn't do what they needed to. <laughs> and it actually led to the company closing. Like they, just, they actually couldn't sustain themselves and had to fold. Um, and just like all of that was down to a lack of like verified information of what was actually going on. I think this is going to become more and more of a problem. Um, and eventually something LinkedIn's going to have to sort out. But it was it was just a great bit of free publicity and like engagement for the week where like we've already got enough news, like the, all the stuff that Ross has talked about, the fact that the website is finally live after we thought it was cursed. Um, and then we have this idiot show up and try to pretend like he's one of the team. And <clears throat> the only lesson I'm taking from it really is that everyone looks at our engineering and thinks that we're fantastic, which I would say that we are, and therefore wants to be part of the team. So I'm taking it as a massive win for uh, Anchor, Ross, and the dev team, and that like they're so good, people want to impersonate them. Um, and I don't think there's like a much better compliment that you get from the community of scammers than that. Yeah, for sure. I think well said. Um, and yeah, if only, if only he, um, yeah, had just maybe picked a less sort of like <laughs> a company less focused on exactly this, he might have been able to get away with it. Um, Would have got away with it if it wasn't for these meddling kids. Exactly. Um, exactly. But, but I think the other thing is, I, I don't know if you saw my LinkedIn post. I made a point of like adding the other companies he said that he worked for. I have a sneaking suspicion we were the only real one. Like, I genuinely mm-hmm. don't think there are others. So I do wonder, like, I think I think there's something very, yeah, very strange going on with that. Very strange. Yeah. And the other thing you can quite quickly do with these things is you just, you just go to their post history and realize the account only got created about a week or two ago. And then you're like, oh, they've got no history. They've got no, like, trusted history. They've never interacted, done a like, commented... So, it, um, yeah, the starts to fall down pretty quickly. Um, we've got a request to come up, so I will bring you up, uh, Crypto Library. Um, if you have something to say, feel free to, free to come on up. Uh, it should be connecting now. So um, I will, I, I'll, just, um, I'll just continue in the meantime, because I know Spaces is not the fastest thing. So... Um, and just kind of building on, I think you're going to be sick of hearing, hearing the word trust today. Um, I've lost Ross. You've lost me? Mm, I, I haven't. can hear Ross. I think it's you, Matt. I think it's, you, here? I think it's you, Matt. Um, yeah, so just building on this. So, like, we were obviously seeing more and more things, like, validating um, what we've been kind of putting out in the market. And another thing that we noticed this week, which we thought could, could be worth mentioning, is... Um, Accenture, where um, myself, Fraser, and Anchor all previously um, spent some time at, um, every year put out their 2023, well, every year they put out their tech trends. Um, it's normally five trends. They've been doing it for about, I think, 10, 15 years. And often there's um, some good, often there's a little bit of fluff, has to be said. I think we all agreed on that um, when we were there at times. But what was really interesting is for the first time, there's been this huge attention placed on both digital identity and um, data and trust and the first trend which was um, called out was literally di- called digital identity um, and it basically exposed this massive move in the direction towards digital identity being a priority for all and um, making that a priority for governments across the world but also for for companies to focus on and one of the kind of the key quotes that i saw that was just too p- perfect for what we're pushing out was the concept of a trusted, portable digital identity disrupts many of the conventions we've come to accept. Um, and then building off of that, the second trend was all around um, data and how individual data should go from being um, kind of this scarce secret um, 
da- data to something where people can have more ownership over and more un- control over where companies are using it and more consumer choice over that. Um, so yeah, Fraser, I don't know if you got a chance to take a look at those and have any thoughts on that. I did not, but I mean, it, just the bit that you read out was exactly what we're here for. Um, and I mean, there's, there was an SSI group in inside Accenture for a long time, like myself, Anchor, I think maybe even briefly yourself were part of it. Um, I think what's fascinating is they haven't got to the point that we have, which is like how the market actually functions. So they're very much looking at it just, I would assume, purely from an EU regs perspective and what's happening in Canada, <clears throat> but not really like haven't really learned any lessons for the fact that myself and Anchor left because there was just like a market problem that needed fixing. Um, so I think I think it's a sign, and I think it's actually a sign of where like the current market's at, but why we have a bit of an edge, which is everyone's still at this point of like, oh, the regs are coming and things are going to change. And what we're seeing is basically a load of companies going, shit, like it's going to change. How do we still make the same money that we do now? Or how do we take advantage of it? Um, and I wonder in the background if Accenture's like, okay, we're going to put this like trend into the market because we definitely know that that's the way it's going but they either haven't sussed out the issues that we're seeing and are seeing traction on or they're just like it's hidden in the background and they're desperately trying to figure it out um but Mm -hmm. i think it's i think it's really good for us like really good for us and um i think it's just a sign that like everything is waking up at the same time it's not just regulations it's like everyone knows that this is going to come and i think this is another sign that like i guess if we're going back to the Gartner hype, hype cycle, it's further along than it ever has been. Um, and yeah, I've, I, I think it can only be positive. Um, trust me, I do still need to read it. So yeah, give me some slack. <laughs> no, I think, you, I think you've probably, you've covered enough there. I think you can probably read through the lines of what, what it's saying. Um, cool. Well, thanks so much, Toby, for, for sharing so much about trust. I think it's amazing to have someone with, with kind of real almost like academic um, trust knowledge now and um, over the next couple of weeks couple of months we're going to be continuing to write different pieces of content all focused on trust and explore how trust um, just want to um, as well Ross just 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 to interrupt you there sorry um so with them um, with the future blogs I just I just want to make it really clear like Nikki is on on this uh, call who's our advisor who I've actually quoted in in the blog and and Ross has written a dissertation on this. So we're literally surrounded by actual bona fide trust experts, which is great. And like, and what we really want to achieve with this, this let's say narrative around trusted data markets moving forward, which Ross is going to be very instrumental in with, as is Fraser, as hopefully you know, Nikki helps with that particular blog, really, really help guide it, to be frank, is we'll be able to now focus more on use cases, right? So the use cases will be the actual types of, trusted data markets that we want to bring to checked, um, the ideas that are catching uh, friction, uh, not friction, sorry, adoption. Sorry, it's been a really long week, by the way, as well. I've done a lot of meetings this week. It was really sick. So um, I'm trying my best. But, but basically, I'd move into use cases um, to really outline how a trusted data market can actually work with checked. And I think Alex and Ross are going to write a more technical kind of sister blog to the one I released, which will go through the actual mechanics how, of how checked as a as let's say a, a product can support this but like you know just keep your eyes open for that because these these particular use case blogs are probably going to be a little bit easier to pass and um i'm hoping that we can get really good involvement from people like nikki fraser ross alex anchor the whole the whole gang really um because it's really genuinely exciting you know it really really is talking to these customers seeing their eyes light up you know seeing the ability to innovate with customer data and yet create revenue at the same time uh, you know, it's going to be a really cool next three months, I think. Yeah, yeah, strongly agree, Toby, and um, being well driven forward by you. Brilliant. Um, so, yeah, coming to the end of our um, our end of the month session today, and um, there's a f- couple more things that I just want to mention um, that are going to be going ahead over the next month. So, um, the event season is properly kicking back up now. Um, Fraser was at um, an, an event earlier this month. Um, was it this month or? I've what month is it anymore? I've lost. I'm not yeah, sure it was. Um, there was. Wait, what have I been to? I've been to East Denver, which I think was this month, maybe, or February. Yeah, that was it. And then I was, I went to Paris Blockchain Week, but didn't go to the main event, but went to pretty much every side event, which 
convenient or unconvenient, they all happen in bars. Yeah. It's poor, poor you having to spend some time in Paris bars. Shocking. <laughs> Shocking. I, to, to, use a, to use a joke, my, my dad used to use was like at the point where I pop it, like someone's going to have to come and kick my liver to death. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so yeah, so so going forward, I guess a, a quick brief mention of what's happening over the next month, um, and kind of the support that you you all can give would be really appreciated. So Fraser will be heading to Consensus 2023, where we are actually going to be sponsoring um, a rooftop event there, and um, expecting I think it's in the it's in the multiple thousands of people there, and we're actually going to be um, excited to have um, a, a demo there, which we're uh, looking forward to, to getting out. So that's going to be a great event. Um, We've also got um, EIC Berlin. I don't even know what that stands for. A European, what is that phrase? European it's Identity Conference? European Identity Cloud Conference. And you've already missed one. So there's IIW as well. And IIW as well. So yeah, that was last on my list. So then Anchor and Alex will be heading over to California to IIW. So um, there's going to be a big month for events and partnerships. And um, yeah, we'll probably be, um, you know, I know Fraser and Anchor are brilliant at putting out tweet storms during the events and keeping us all updated on that. So um, keep an eye out for those. I think um, also if, if any of you happen to be either living at any of those nearby or like even a short flight away, start letting us know. Because um, it is the kind of thing, especially if we're going all the way across to like Mountain View, San Francisco or uh, Texas and like Austin, um, getting a short internal flight is is not the worst thing in the world um so if you're around and not too far let us know it's always good to meet more people like um i did manage to catch uh chappy Chapo like really really briefly last week um unfortunately didn't catch up properly this week but there's gonna be more times um and if anyone's ever in like anywhere near those places just let us know because it's always good to meet up and actually do that in person rather than um always doing it anonymously over a phone call or an AMA. Yeah, for sure. It's um, yeah, going to be great. Hopefully this year we'll get to meet lots more of our community across the world. Brilliant. Well, yeah, thanks everyone for joining once again.